I mean, nothing says Christmas than sea monsters. Uh, I did want to show a couple pictures, but I wasn't able to get my pictures together. But I wanted to give you just a couple little Christmas stories about Monterey, at least from my end of my research uh, uh, in the fishing world. So in the 1930s, just about uh, this time of year, 1935, 1936, the Monterey starting fishermen are catching lots and lots of anchovies. Right? Anchovies, of course, are schooling fish would run off them with the sardine fishery. Uh, and uh, but anchovies were a problem for the Monterey sardine fish run because they catch a net full of anchovies. Are very mon and the anchovies are smaller than those sardines, and they'll get caught into the mesh of the net, and then they'll secrete this mucus that will destroy that cotting netting. That cotton netting can cost up to $15,000 in 1935. That was a huge amount of money. Uh, and uh, so uh, they had to figure out a way to get rid of those, uh, those anchovies. So they'd pull them up with the big boom on the boat and they would come up and look like a, uh, and, they, and of course all the shiny little anchovies, they look like a Christmas tree. And so that's what all the fishermen would refer to it as a Christmas tree. Now, if you remember from the last program I did, I did show some pictures of some of that where they where the Rapa family would run their barge out to help those fish and get rid of all those uh, those uh, those uh, anchovies off the net. They used to dip them in big vats of hot water and then they would have to then dip the nets into uh, the into the tannic oak solution to, to re help fix that net because the net was uh, very expensive. Also, one of my favorite stories, of course, was the center, starting canneries themselves uh, were not unionized until 1938 when the AF of L came in, the American Federation of Labor came in, unionized, unionized all those workers. Uh, the cannery owners are very resistant to any kind of union coming into those canneries. Uh, well, a few months after the AF of L came in, the CIO, which was then a separate union, and uh, they came and said, well, you know what, we can get you uh, better working conditions and better pay, and you won't have to work all those long hours. And so a lot of the workers signed up for the CIO, and the county owners refused to negotiate with them. They said, we already dealt with the AFL, we're not dealing with that CIO. Besides, the CIO was kind of a radical union then, and they just didn't want to deal with that. But a number of the workers did sign up for it. So they said any worker who signed up for the CIO were not allowed to work at any of the canneries for the 1938-39 sardine season. Now, this went on for a number of weeks. And finally, two weeks before Christmas, 1938, the CIO workers sent their children on a march. And they marched from downtown Monterey, all along the waterfront, all the way down to Cannery Row. And the kids were all carrying these big signs that said, Santa Claus can't come to my house because daddy works for the CIO. So eventually they settled that. And uh, at one point, eventually the CIO acting in AFL merged as one union. So I know enough of that. I'd like to introduce my guest, my good friend, Jeffrey Dunn from all the way across the bay from Santa Cruz. And uh, Jeff's going to, uh, he's got, he's, he's the guy. He's going to talk about those sea monsters in our midst. And he's been doing this research for a long time. Jeff is a wonderful maritime historian. And uh, I learned a lot from Jeff when I'm here from talk. So Jeff, take it away. All right. I'm going to see if I can do this share screen here right now. We up? Yeah. We're running. All right. Uh, the old man of Monterey Bay is uh, what the sea monster was referred to. Uh, in Monterey, it was referred to as Bobo, B-O-B-O, um, -B -O, which happens to be my nickname uh, that my family members call me. And it's, uh, it's a sort of bastardization of the Genovese dialect, meaning uncle, Borba. And um, I don't know... I don't speak Sicilian, um, so I don't know if that's the case. This is a picture of the um, old man of Monterey Bay. It was done by a cartoonist named Tom Tommy Thompson. And I show this picture because um, this drawing, it actually sits about mm, seven feet from me right now, the original. And it's what I grew up with as a little kid. So what I want to say is, is this story, this history came to me through imagery and talking to family members, not from uh, 
going through history books or reading in newspaper clippings, although I've done both since. But this was really a story that was alive with me um, throughout my childhood. Uh, and so I guess in a certain way, it was, it was a little bit like uh, Santa Claus, right? Uh, a mythical story that takes on a life of its own. And Tim, as you know, I don't like to uh, talk about regional history uh, without acknowledging that uh, there's a lot of human history before us, uh, Native peoples. This is a drawing from San Francisco Bay, and I show it just to remind people that when we talk about maritime and nautical history, local Ohlone, uh, Native American, Yupai people, um, various uh, natives along the central California coast were maritime people, very much so. And it would be interesting to know if they had myths and stories about quote unquote monsters in their midst as well. If anyone knows of any of those stories, I, I'd certainly love to hear about them. You can get a hold of Tim and let him know about those. Um, one of the things I've discovered since I was a kid and I always collect them, are stories of sea monsters. And, uh, and they really come from all over. And there are myths uh, and legends, even religious, uh, uh, to the point of being formal religious uh, 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 cultural aspects to sea monsters. Here's a early sea monster draft from the, uh, uh, oh, I think this is 14th century. If you look at early maps of California, the Pacific, uh, but again, anywhere in the globe, you see in the maps drawings of sea monsters and where there were alleged encounters with sea monsters. Uh, you see the Spanish galleon here encountering uh, sea monsters and of course, mermaids. Um, This is 16th century myth uh, and another various visions of sea monsters. And you see this dragon-like figure at the bottom, uh, sea monsters. Of course, Leviathan, the great whale. Um, and this, this was the imagery for Thomas Hobbes uh, famous work called Leviathan, which was a he used it as a metaphor for human social order, human uh, social organizations, and that government or the public sphere would at one point become a leviathan, uh, a sea monster of sorts. Again, another variation of leviathan and, and, and various images of it there are similarities that, that come through. The, these fins on the back, uh, angry facial features, and various uh, amounts of arms, legs, and ways of moving in the ocean. Um, and of course, there are leviathans in the ocean. Uh, whales of all sort are depicted as well. And early days, sea, members of seafaring uh, communities would encounter them um, for who knows how long. And then th there are actually real sea monsters out there. This is one that was uh, photographed in the 30s. One that was um, photographed recently down near Santa Barbara um, that washed the shore. So the idea of there being sea monsters, we've documented for millennia um, and just how large and how they behave uh, varies, but you know, they still happen to this day, uh, wash up on uh, local beaches. And they're honored. This is a uh, garden and this sea monster is made out of various vegetables in a public garden down in Southern California and still honored to this day, the whole notion that sea monsters are, are, are part of our 
collective myth along the California coast. Um, this was one of the first documents I found. It was out of Long Beach, it was in the Santa Cruz Sentinel in the 19th century. Devil fish makes away with girl. Long Beach is a scene of an exciting fight to rescue a young woman from the deathly clutches of a sea monster. And what this was, was a large octopus that grabbed hold of a young girl and literally pulled her underwater and required being rescued. So this division between the ocean and land uh, was very important. And once you entered into the ocean, you are entering into the unknown. In some ways, you are entering into the mythical. Land was safe, but once you got to the water's edge, it took on a whole different meaning and connotation. Now, this is a clip from Santa Cruz that I found. Again, uh, the date on this is 1909. Um, a 70 a foot long whale had washed up on Waddell Beach, which is on the north coast of Santa Cruz, up toward the uh, San Mateo County line. Uh, and it says a large whale 70 feet long has washed ashore uh, on Waddell Beach. These large sea monsters wash in from the ocean and bay quite frequently. They are supposed to meet their death at the hands of swordfish. Only last week, a fight was noticed out in the bay where there was apparently a great struggle from the way the big fish flopped around and cut up the water. So there's actually something real going on out in, uh, out in the bay and out in the Pacific um, that's beyond the mythical and beyond the imagination. So I saw a lot of encounters and articles about that along the coast around sea monsters. Um, and then I noticed an ad for the new Santa Cruz Theater, uh, which is downtown Santa Cruz and is now a, uh, the Walnut Cafe on Walnut Avenue in Santa Cruz. And among the films being shown, um, was this film called Wonders of the Sea. I've never uh, found a copy of it. Photographed at the bottom of the sea, showing bloodthirsty octopuses, man-eating sharks, deadly mores, dangerous barracuda, and every other ferocious sea monster in his natural lair. Which is uh, interesting that on the big screen, the silver screen, relatively new to Santa Cruz and the Monterey Bay in terms of having um, picture show theaters was that they were showing sea monsters. And so they became part of sort of what I would say the, the collective psychology of the community, this notion of sea monsters. So this is in the 1920s. And then uh, in 1925, it was a fascinating occurrence um, that happened at Moore's Beach. Now, Moore's Beach is now Natural Bridges State Beach on the northern end of Santa Cruz. And I found this clipping originally probably when I was in my 20s. So getting up to 40 years ago. Uh, and I've kept, I've documented images of it. Um, ever since. So this was considered to be a bottlenose porpoise or whale. Um, and it washed up to the beach at Moore's Beach. Um, I'll get a little better image, some better imagery of it here. Here are some of the photos that I've collected of it. Um, you see this large body looking a bit like a dinosaur or dragon um, stretched out 35, 40 feet in length uh, and with a clear bottle nose. Again, another shot of it. 
Uh, the woman on the left is at the head. This is the tail, but you see the uh, fins, fin-like top on top of the animal. Another shot of the head, um, roughly four feet width. And another shot of the head. So scientists came down and looked at it. There was some contention about what it was, but it clearly was viewed as a mammal. Um, and had a very large head and no one had really seen anything like it before. And the, the scientists identified it as a duck-billed porpoise, okay? Now, this is Santa Cruz, uh, right near where the main wharf is. And what I wanna show you, and Tim, you've got images from Monterey that show the same thing the size of the fish and size of the catches um, that were taking place at this time. Santa Cruz had a little bit earlier um, entry into commercial fishery, but not much. Uh, there were Chinese uh, fishermen, of course, in Monterey and in Santa Cruz as well. And really the Chinese sort of established the commercial fishing industry in the region. In Santa Cruz, there was um, California entry into the fishing industry, and then um, the entrance of Genovese fishermen, which is what my family is from. Uh, I grew up in the Santa Cruz Italian fishing uh, colony um, that was established in the late 19th century and reached its peak um, probably around the 1920s and 1930s. Parallel history to the Monterey Sicilian fishing uh, colony, but different fish caught and really very different waters, as you know, uh, for the large part. Okay, in the 1930s, and the first indication of a sea monster during that era that I came across um, was one, and Tim has helped me find Sal Coletto's uh, writing about it and that I read. Uh, he was the captain of the purse Saner, the Dante Alighieri. And he and his crew um, that included Dominic Costanza, uh, many of the Coletto family, Sal, Caesar, Vincent, and uh, Ratsy, Tredo Ballesteri, Jack and Al Aiello, Vince Catina, Art Napoli, all saw the sea monster. And their descriptions were fairly similar. It looked like the face of a very old man or a monkey with two eyes twice the diameter of breakfast buns and a marth mouth like a crescent moon. Barnacles were all over the head and also along the black body. Folds of white skin hung beneath the neck. The body was as big around as a pickup truck. It must have weighed maybe eight or nine tons. All of the accounts were very similar. Okay, almost immediately, Within a few years or so, a similar um, creature, sea monster, was seen in Santa Cruz. Now, you'll recognize those names that I just mentioned from Monterey. Generations of uh, Monterey fishermen, going back two, three generations. The same here in this report. Um, old man appears and Johnny Bassano, Bill Royce, Lyle Terra, Joe Luero, and Joe Totten all saw it. Now I'm going to tell you, I worked with four of those guys when I was a kid and they all told me the story of the sea monster. Um, three of them are family members of mine. So 
this idea of a sea monster coming out of Monterey Bay becomes now popular on both sides of the bay. I showed you uh, the shot of the uh, a drawing, cartoon drawing from Santa Cruz. This is a cartoon drawing of what was seen from Monterey. And again, similarities are, are pretty remarkable. Again, Santa Cruz and Monterey fishermen and fishermen up and down the coast were seeing um, large fish and, and mammals coming out of the bay. This is uh, uh, likely a century old sunfish, which we called up here Mola Mola. Um, that was, it makes it look like it was caught by uh, this fisherman. It wasn't, he shot it um, off Westcliff Drive and brought it in where it hung for several weeks on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. Um, and you can see they dressed it up. He goes from, they put the thousand pound sign on it. Now they add fish and a young lady in a bathing suit, suit to it as a way to commercialize it. And then they add fishing trips um, to it. So, you know, the, the, the mola mola, the sea monster is commercialized uh, immediately as well. Uh, my mom remembered the smell and told me it was absolutely horrid uh, after two or three weeks. Another shot, that's my Aunt Betty who lived in Monterey for many years, but was in Santa Cruz at this time and the giant octopus, uh, probably similar in size to um, that octopus that we read about uh, off the coast of Los Angeles. Um, and that's Ernest Otto, famous waterfront historian and, and journalist on the left. He walked on the Santa Cruz piers. There were multiple piers every day and reported all the catches that he saw. So if you want to go back and see what was being caught, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, his column was called On the Waterfront. And uh, you could see who was catching what. Now I show this because this is a shot uh, from Monterey and that's my great uncle Catardo Monclawero with a giant squid that was caught. Again, this no, these large entities coming out of the bay, the waters of the bay, which let's be candid are still mysterious. And if you've spent time out on the bay fishing uh, or just out having fun, you, you get a sense that there's something below the surface, especially when you're out over the canyon, that's unknown, mysterious. Um, and for fishermen, it, it's always been uh, a little bit of a bit of fear that they don't know what's, what's underneath it. Augie Kanepa, another old man I fished with uh, in 1942, goes through a dis discussion of his encounter with the old man of Monterey Bay. And what I found recently was for a whole month on the front page of the Santa Cruz Sentinel, um, they would have accounts of the old man and interview local fishermen um, about when and how they had seen it. Another headlines in the Sentinel, Old Man of Bay is here again. Um, and they're calling it here, Shades of Moby Dick. And I see this one is uh, my uncle Molio Stagnero and cousin Robbie Stagnero saw it. This is again in the 1940s. Very publicized here in Santa Cruz. Not, I haven't seen the kind of press in the old Herald clippings that there are here. Of course, there was a need to explain this. Um, I can tell you, having known a lot of the men who said they saw it, they were serious guys. This, this 
some of them like to uh you know hit the uh red vino a little bit but for the most part these were very serious fishermen not not guys who would make up stories about this so the idea was that there had to be something real behind it um and what they came to see think was that these were elef sea elephants as they called them which we now refer to as elephant seals and uh i don't know let me say this i was just down at uh Pedros Blancas, uh, the southern end of Big Sur, just north of San Simeon this last weekend. And there are thousands of, of uh, elephant seals down there now coming to shore each year. When I was a kid, they didn't come to shore. They were very rare. I actually, my first job at the University of California was driving a, a boat from the mainland out to Año Nuevo Island where they were landing and where there was a large herd forming uh, in the 1970s, 50 years ago. And now in the last 20 or 30 years, and maybe someone's more of an expert on the uh, sea elephants than I am down in Pedras Blancas. My memory is, is into the 1980s, early 80s, I never saw them down there. And I used to surf th that coast quite a bit uh, and fish it too, but really, um, surf it and i didn't see elephant seals down there that my memory is as they started to land in in the 1980s so they've been colonizing down there for about 40 years now and huge numbers i mean but they were rare to be seen at this time so it's possible they were elephant seals they are uh, if you're close to them out at sea when they they, they come up they can be uh intimidating uh, but they're not as big as um, the animal that was described by these fishermen. They're not as long, but they certainly are beefy and they have that rubberized white neck that was called and they have uh, a beak. So it's possible that's what they were seeing. Um, again, the Santa Cruz Sentinel really played up the notion of the old man of Monterey Bay and used it as a way of promoting visitors to Santa Cruz. Um, this guy in this photo is uh, Skip Littlefield who really, really drummed up the story of the sea serpent here um, and used it to promote the water carnival at the Santa Cruz Plunge uh, and Boardwalk. So it was, uh, they used it to, um, as a promotional tool, but again, you see Santa Cruz Plunge written on this, this body with the fins and 200 days till the new carnival arrives in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz's sneaking sea serpent, seen surf snaking. Now, uh, they did it in conjunction with celebrations of the Santa Cruz fishing colony and every year uh, early in the fishing season they would have these performances of uh, Santa Cruz Italian fishermen singing Italian songs um, and they would pass the uh, bottle around and get these guys loomed up and I say that I'm related to everyone in this photograph um, and worked with many of them in fact, the guy right in the middle of the front row, I'm looking at him now, is my great uncle Risho, and he was the guy who mentored me in the art of fish filleting. Uh, and I used to fish with the guy on his right, my great uncle Trub. And you can see them here with uh, the accordions um, performing in a band, uh, and that happened every year in Santa Cruz for many years. Back to the um, back to this drawing. This drawing got lots of attention, and it was reproduced in a lot of newspapers uh, by Tommy Thompson, um, who was the lead cartoonist for many years for the Cal Bulletin. Back when we had 
real newspapers and um, I've, I've seen copies of this image all over and fortunately he, he had a bit of a crush on one of my aunts and gave her the original and um, I got it uh, after she passed away. So on the left of this image, which is interesting, you see the grappa here in the middle of the, right at the water line, um, referencing the uh, Italian drinking tendencies. Um, and this, these are kind of the, the non-fishermen. Uh, these guys were mostly landlubbers. Um, and then, actually listed the names of people who had seen the sea monster in recent times. Lawrence Ozalezzi, Bill Totten, Marco Oliveri, Willie Pichotto, Serafino Canepa, Lily Manu and Treb Gio, et cetera. Very familiar names in Santa Cruz for 40, 50 years. Um, and very similar to the names that um, popped up in Monterey. These were not people on the outskirts of the fishing community. They were people who were central to the community. And then here are the guys on the boats. I noticed there's another uh, grappa jug um, and where it's called a piscatorial paradox. Um, it was in fact so famous that a local Santa Cruz artist wrote a response to Tommy. He called him Thomas Anchovy Thompson, um, and it was Leo Seifert, and he drew his own version of the uh, old man. So again, very engaged. This is, uh, and this is interesting. This is after the beginning of World War II that this interest in the, in the uh, sea monster is continuing um really extensively i mean these these sightings are right along reports of what's happening in europe and in the pacific fronts and again the one from monterey sort of mirroring what happened in, later in santa cruz with tommy thompson now i show this because and i know the uh, cartoons reversed on the bottom but i wanted to show the the interesting parallel. There's no way that Thompson ever saw this photograph. These photographs uh, were not public. They were, um, I, I found them in various archives, but very similar shape, size, length, etc., to what had been found on Moore's Beach. 20 years earlier. And then in going through um, old newspapers, I saw that Lake Como had a sea monster that developed in popularity after the war. Uh, in 1950, a sea monster up in uh, Oregon was later thought to be a giant uh, squid. And then in the 1960s, this is a call, um, Views from the Waterfront, that was written by my Aunt Stella uh, in the Santa Cruz Sentinel, who revived the idea from 20 years earlier of Tommy Thompson's Old Man of Monterey Bay and that various members of the fishing community were spotting it again in the 1960s. So, go to this for, and then come back to this. I still at this point don't know quite what to make of it, sort of culturally, uh, socially, anthropologically this myth of sea monsters and what um, what it means about 
the fishing communities around Monterey Bay or around the world and what the psychological implications of it are. But about 20 years ago, I set about seeing if I could find the remnants of the um, animal that had washed up on shore at Moore's Beach. And supposedly, the uh, someone can help me with this, the uh, Marine Sciences Division of the Institute at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco um, had come down to collect the remnants of the of the animal. And I wrote and I went up and talked to people up there, was told no, wasn't there, wasn't there, wasn't there. And then finally, I found someone who said, yes, we think we have what you're looking for. And so I had a friend take some photos of it. This was the skeleton, the head of the animal that washed up on um, uh, Moore's Beach in 1925. And they now are calling it a uh, beaked whale and with a little design of what it probably looked like um, before it washed ashore. And then here's a better shot of it. Um, and that exists to, to this day up at the uh, Natural Science Museum in Golden Gate Park. They actually um, brought it out for an exhibit for about a year or so. Um, and had it out on display. So that's that story. Um, love to have any thoughts, ideas, questions. We there, Tim? So I'm here. So if anybody has any questions or you want to please open up your microphone and, and ask away. It does look like we've got something in the um, chat. It right. said, you mentioned the difference of waters off Santa Cruz and Monterey. Could you elaborate on that? Thank you. Yeah, Santa Cruz has a much more uh, gradual sandy um, coastline than Monterey does. Um, if, if you go down and, uh, you know, just think about uh, Point Lobos and the uh, uh, granite cliffs down there, we have nothing like that. Um, and since we're on the north end of the bay, we get hit with different storms in our uh, uh, the, we have a very different uh, kelp formations than you do down there. So we don't have any of that clear water uh, up here that you have down there and fishing is, is different. Um, we never had anywhere near the type of abalone or urchin fishery that you had down there. Um, it's just, it's, it's different. Uh, I don't know. What about Pompano down there, Tim? Yeah, not so much. I mean, yeah, they get them, but. Yeah, and we had big pompano fisheries up right. here. Conversely, um, because we didn't have uh, a large enough, safe enough harbor, we didn't get the big Persane boats for sardines. So we didn't have a real uh, sardine fishery located up here. They used to come and visit up here. Uh, I went down to the wharf this morning uh, to take a walk, and I was surprised by the number of anchovies in and here we are around christmas time they could there have had the a, huh yeah there they are <laughs> yeah we could we could have had a christmas tree um <laughs> and i mean in thick and very large uh uh large numbers of uh, uh pelicans and other seabirds diving for them today usually we got these in summer up here and now we're getting them year round so I'm curious if anybody's in the audience today has, has seen a sea monster in Monterey Bay or heard about them from a grandparent or a parent or somebody you know. Yeah, 
maybe not. Maybe they'll, they'll pop yeah. up. Anyone? Well, let me tell you this. This is what's trippy to me. Tim, you um, and I are. There was somebody in the um in the chat that said that. Um, they said their nano saw one. Okay. Many years ago, when they were fishing in the bay. Um, ah. And then Mike Sovereign has also said, I believe a beaked whale was identified after washing ashore about 20 years, and there was a picture in the Herald. It, 20 years ago? Yeah. Oh, wow. That I'd love to see that. Uh, I'd love to see that clip. I, I don't know about that, because that, that, that's a great link to this beaked whale. Um, yeah. And that would be really neat to see. Um, I is something we need to look through the look through the um, microfilm for. Okay. If anyone finds any news or anything, please get it to Tim. Um, that would be great, or to the library. That would be fascinating. Let me tell you what I realized, Tim. As you, well, you and I are roughly the same age. Right. Um, the guys I fished with were roughly my age now when I was fishing with them in my teens and 20s. So, you know, they seemed very old. <laughs> to me. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> and I guess I'm feeling old enough. But, you know, and now I see why. I thought, wow, when they, the, this serpent would come up or this monster, they'd get very vital and have vivid memories of it and very excited about this era in local history where there were these monsters on both sides of the bay. And I realized, you know, I've been following this story for 40, 50 years. And uh, um, I'm, I'm glad to know there's still interest in it. And, uh, but I still don't have any solid conclusion on what it was. But if there was another one of those, uh, uh, beaked whales. I would love to uh, to find out about it. I know when I was with the Maritime Museum, I spent a lot of time with the Coletto family, and that story is still a oh, big thing in their family. Uh, the Bobo story. Yeah. And uh, well, let me ask: you, Are there are there members of the family still around? Uh, yeah, oh. there are. I'm not sure if they're in Monterey now, but there are definitely still members. Yeah, I saw some of Sal's. Uh, Grandkids have moved out of town. Yeah. Uh, one member of the fishing family knocked me from second base into the outfield one time. We won't go. We won't go into that. But um, I, he told me he had heard about uh, the sea monsters as a kid as well. Member of the Cardinali yeah. family. Very good. Any other questions? comments what do you think tim what do i think about sea monsters about this yeah I, oh i think it's terrific it just adds to the maritime history of monterey and santa cruz it's really a california story um and what it was i don't know um who knows like you said we have a lot of things and if you which i follow the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has a wonderful Facebook page, and they're showing all these incredible creatures that they're discovering out there in the out under, you know, in, in, in the canyon. And just who knows what, what that thing could have been. So, you yeah. know, and I did a lot of work with fishing game, particularly I think J.D. Phillips, who was the fishing game guy here in Monterey from the late twenties all the way to the into the late sixties. And uh, his photo collection shows all kinds of unusual things that were caught by fishermen that he would go and photograph uh, because they'd never seen it before or, should, you know, it was something extremely rare. So, yeah. There was lots of stuff. There was lots of stuff. There was lots of stuff. And, you know, I noticed that one of the clips, they, they uh, uh, is it Rolf Bolin who they, was the- Rolf Bolin, yeah. How do you say his last name? It's Bolin. He was an ichthyologist at Hopkins. Yeah, yeah. He was a good friend of J.B. Phillips. And he used to, in fact, I was told that Ralph Bolin and J.B. Phillips used to bring the uh, young students to his, to Bolin's house, and they would fleece him in, in poker games. <laughs> so. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Well, my aunt remembered him yeah. as being this 
dignified thief. And yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so he was but, he was a signer of the petition, actually. Right. I saw his signature on the on the petition. Mm -hmm. And um, but he was like the authority figure for Monterey yes. Bay scientific stuff. We didn't have anyone like that up on this end of the bay. My so old friend guy. My old friend Bill Ripley, who since passed away, but he was a, a biologist at the California Department of Fishing Game, uh, went to Hopkins in the 1930s, and he used to tell me that he was 100% student body of Ralph Bolin. He was his only student, yeah, at that time. Wow, wow, that's a great story. Anyway, I'm just thinking back to the back to the difference between uh, Monterey and Santa Cruz. Uh, different sides of the bay, yeah. different surf action, different groundswell action. Uh, I could argue it's one of the reasons we have a better surfing wave up here than you usually find down in, in, in Monterey. Although sure. I always love to surf down there and I used to surf in Carmel and down the coast, but it, it's, a, it's a different break for sure. Yeah. Um, and the real major difference was the lack of a natural harbor for the larger boats. So the sardine fishery was located almost exclusively in Monterey. Right. And so that was a major, major difference. And the, and the economy of the canneries that grew up around the Monterey waterfront, we had very little of that here. Right. You know, we are our, our, literally our harbor, our major, um, it's fascinating. Our major wharf was built, the one that still exists today was built to accommodate cement from the cement plant in Davenport. Okay, so there were railroad links running out to the very end of the, um, of the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf where they would uh, bring in all sorts of, of things, but where they were sending out cement for shipping. So it's a, it's a very different maritime history. Oh yeah, most, oh absolutely, yeah. And different boats yeah. because of that. We, ne we never had, any, the, we would get the big saners after they were, <laughs> after they were done being used and use them for party boats. <laughs> yeah. Go out, you know, for, for fishermen with their drop lines, but they were not used as, as same boats here. We couldn't handle it. Yeah. No, totally different. And Monterey, of course, so dependent on the sardine fishery. And it was a multi-million dollar industry. I mean, everybody in Monterey, one way or another, was associated with it. So, big time. Yes. Very different. Anything uh, else? I know. It was a terrific program, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Well, it's, it's a great gift for me to see you during this holiday season. Yeah, thank and, you. And uh, we've got to keep finding these stories and yeah. them out there. And I'm going to follow up on a trip to, uh, I really want to take that trip with you down to uh, Big Sur. Anytime. Okay. I mean that, my friend. And anybody out there, if you uh, have any questions or anything about Monterey history, uh, uh, just send me an email. And if I don't know the answer, I will guarantee you I know somebody that will know the answer. So just send me an email at timsardine at yahoo.com, and I will get it, I promise. And I hope you all enjoyed our programs this year. And we have uh, more exciting things coming up for next year. And uh, and I hope you all have a happy Christmas holiday and happy new year and all that stuff.